Hi again, folks. Thursday afternoon, about four o'clock. Going to have about a 20 or 25 minute video. We're going to begin chapter six on page 184 and 185. Talks about bone and bone tissue. You can read the introduction. It talks about how slugs move so slowly. You know, they don't have a skeleton inside like we do. They do have muscles. So uh, they move along, but it takes them a while to get there. Anyway, <clears throat> when you uh, come down to the bottom, you see it, uh, module 6.1, introduction to bones as organs. And of course, when you think of organs, you think of different tissues coming together, like with your stomach, there's nerve tissue, there's um, muscle tissue, there's epithelial tissue, there's cardiovascular tissue. So that's an organ. Well, you got a similar situation with the bone. They mention it up here in this little uh, section right above where it says module 6.1. You think of the bone just being calcium, but it's not. It's uh, organic tissue. It's inorganic tissue. It's got nerves involved with it. It's got blood vessels involved with it. So it's got several different types of tissues, and that is what we call an organ, and they all work together for the good of the body. So when you uh, come down to module 6.1, you see there are learning outcomes and you want to know those four. Over on page 185, you have a nice picture and it gives you just a couple of functions about um, the, the skeletal system, how they, what are the, what do those bones do for us? Uh, they give you just a few things, but if you look over on page, well, on that page too, 185, and then also 186, they give you a little more uh, in terms of function. Nothing heavy. You just got to know it. Okay? So my Bible will ask you about that in a couple of weeks. Not next week, but the week after. Look at your fall schedule 2020. Okay? So, we come down to um, something you already know about. That's kind of nice, isn't it? On the second um, paragraph, but you can also do the flashback there on page 186 and the quick check. But you come over to the second column, and you probably in lab have uh, talked about the shapes of bones, long bones, irregular bones, flat bones, and things like that. Again, you want to uh, know those, get those refreshed in your mind so you don't miss those. And so we're going to talk about long bones, and then we'll mention a little bit about uh, short bones and things like that. Um, but anyway, it goes all the way over to page 187 in terms of the types of bones, and hopefully you're already familiar with that, where you can find those bones. So as you look at the structure of a long bone, and you probably know some terminology here, as you look on page 187 and figure 6.3, you see it says the structure of a long bone, and you look on the, at the two uh, illustrations, you come down to those illustrations and you see hyaline cartilage, articular cartilage, what does that do? What does it do for us? Think about its function, and you come all the way down to the bottom of that bone, you see that blue again, and that tells you that you've got hyaline cartilage there. Why is it there? So you got those two ends, and speaking of the two ends while we got cartilage on them, as you look to the middle, you see epiphysis, and I would believe you know that. That's the end of a bone, long bone, and then you look down at the bottom, and you see the word again. So a long bone has two ends, and each end is called an epiphysis. Epiphyses is the plural for that. So when you look at the uh, illustration over on the, the right, where they've split the bone, by the way, what sort of section is that? You remember that? That was at the first of anatomy. What kind of a section, what sort of plane is that? P-L-A-N-E. What sort of plane is that? So when you look at the top epiphysis, and how would you call that? You wouldn't use the word top, would you? What would you use? 
knowing that you know something about these bones. How would you describe that epiphysis in terms of its position in the body? And how would you describe the one down at the bottom in terms of its position in the body? Get those terms right, okay? Get those terms right. Use them. It's another language, isn't it? But that's what you got to do. I had to do it. You can do it too. So as you look at the, I'll say, top epiphysis, so you'll go look that up because you just might run into it on a test. I want you to know it. They've split it. And you see the red material in there. And you see uh, over to the right, it says red bone marrow which means it's got hematopoietic tissue in it, which is going to make red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and so forth. So in the uh, top there of this long bone, I hope you know what that bone is. That's where you find your red bone marrow. And while we're still above that dotted line, you see epiphyseal lines. Now, if you will look down at the column to the right, come down to the last paragraph and you will see not the one that says structure of short, flat, and irregular and sesamoid bones, but the one right above it. It says one final thing to note. And it talks about the epiphyseal line and the epiphyseal plate. Sometimes they call it a growth plate. But anyway, that's uh, what you want to be able to label on here. And so we'll talk about how that comes into uh, forming the bone a little bit later. Anyway, you've got the red bone marrow. You see the epiphyseal lines. Now, when you come down sort of in the middle where they got the dotted lines below and above, coming back over to the left, you see periosteum. Peri means around, and osteum is a term for bone. So it's a connective tissue that's all around the bone. And you look over to the right, you now we're looking at the diaphysis. You see that in the middle. You come up a little bit and over to the very far right there of the picture, you see it says endosteum. So there's a connective tissue lining in the, I would say medullary care, uh, cavity. Some people say medullary. Some people say uh, med medullary. But anyway, uh, I've always thought that was kind of interesting to say medulla. As some people say, medulla. Well, you go to a book; it'll say it's supposed to be medulla. You don't go to a du uh, you don't go to dull parties, do you? Or you do go to dull parties, but you don't go to dual parties. But anyway, however you want to say it, there's a couple of ways you can do it. And that cavity is lined with a connective tissue that's called the endosteum. And you notice in that marrow cavity in the middle medullary cavity or the medullary cattle, uh, cavity. See the fat in there? Yellow? That's yellow bone marrow. And so we have adipose in there. What's the good of adipose? What's its function? How is it beneficial to us? You know, when, do we just carry this stuff around? No, we can use it. Think about it. We come down to, uh, let's see, what else? Is there any one thing I want you to know? Oh, yes. Um, where you see red bone marrow up at the top and come all the way down to the bottom, that's on the right-hand figure, you see spongy bone, or sometimes they call it cancellous bone. Spongy bone. It really looks like sponge. So at the ends of the long bones, you have spongy bone. It lightens the bone. But you also have, if you come back to the middle over there on the right, where you see the diaphysis, but go over to the right and look right above, you see compact bone. That's dense bone. So you got two kinds of bone that you're responsible for. I don't know if you covered that in the lab or not. That's great if you did. I'm going to cover it and ask you some questions. Let's see, what else did I want you to, uh, to know? I want you to look right above the figure 6.3 where you see structure of a long bone and you come down one, two, three, four lines there, and it says periosteum is composed of dense, irregular, collagenous connective tissue. Very strong, is it? Why is it strong? What makes it strong? You already know that answer. See these questions I can ask, for, ask you on the test? 
All right, I think we've covered that picture well enough. So we go over to over to page 188. And you see figure 6.4, and it's showing you a piece of the skull. That's sort of a flat bone. Now, I know it's not really flat, but they call it flat. It's not a long bone. So, and then you see there underneath their structure, short, flat, irregular, and sesamoid bones. So they consider the, the bones up here to be flat bones. Irregular would be the things like the ethmoid bone, the sphenoid bone, and so forth, uh, the maxillary bone and all that. But what you want to take away with these uh, uh, short bones, what you've got is sort of a, a marrow sandwich. You see it's got compact bone on top. You look over to the right, compact bone on the bottom. That's your two pieces of bread. And then in between there is spongy bone. And you see it says with red bone marrow. So that's what some of these flat bones and these facial bones, some of the sesamoid bones and so forth, um, the little short bones. Where would you find the little short bones? Right around in here, wouldn't you? Even your palm of your hands is considered long, but in here where all these carpals are, that is um, um, short bone. And so now you see how it's composed. It's got marrow in the middle. It's got compact bone all the way around it on the outside. So you can read about blood supply. There's just a little bit down there. Nutrient artery, arteries can't get into the bone um, through a hole in the bone. Got several, and the hole is called a foramen. You know that, don't you? Nutrient foramen means it's taking some uh, blood in there, which would have nourishment for the, the bone cells. On red and bone, or excuse me, red and yellow bone marrow down at the bottom of page 188. You know what that is now. Yellow is uh, got adipose tissue in there, got triglycerides. Red bone marrow has got hematopoietic tissue in it. But you come down to about the fifth or sixth line. It says in infants, young children, most bone marrow is red because they're growing so quickly. At age of five, it begins to, some of the bone marrow, red bone marrow, uh, begins to re, uh, replace. The yellow bone marrow replaces the red bone marrow. And so you look up at the top of the next column, look at the second sentence. It says red marrow remains only in the pelvis. That's where you can get a sample for bone marrow. Proximal femur, like you saw in the previous picture. Humerus. Okay. And you see the vertebra. We don't usually mess with the vertebra. They're too hard to get to, and you can damage a lot of things. But the ribs, the sternum, clavicle, and the scapula. But they'll do the sternum on you. If they need to get a specimen of bone marrow, they'll go to your hip, or they'll usually go to your sternum. Okay, so much for that. Now look over on page 189 at module 6.2. Again, you want to remember the learning outcomes. Now, this is somewhat of a review because as you look at the number one, it says describe the inorganic matrix and the organic matrix components. Chapter four is where we covered that, where we just touched uh, on the matrix in those connective tissues. And of course, bone is a connective tissue. It connects the body together, doesn't it? And two, three, and four in the next column about the cells that make it up and their functions and so forth. So you see in the next sentence, it says the primary tissue found in bone tissue, normally called osseous, osseous tissue. Come down to extracellular matrix of the bone. And you've already covered that to some degree in chapter four. You go back and review it. And then you look at that first little paragraph and it talks about the 65% uh, uh, of the weight of a bone is inorganic material and the other 35% is organic. What's the difference between inorganic and organic matrices? You should be able to tell me that. I want you to understand that. What is in there? Now notice down below that picture, 
here we have to have the right concentration of uh, organic matrix and inorganic matrix. If you don't have that right combination, which is a 65-35 deal, we have some problems. How does your body to know? How does your body know to do that? To keep things just where they ought to be. It's called homeostasis. And you can't get away from that. Just work it into your head and start thinking along those lines. But you can see in those two pictures, you, you got a fibula over to the right, to the left. That's that outside bone on your lower leg. You look to those pictures, and if you don't have enough of the organic matrix, your bones become brittle. That's what happens to old people like me. Gotta be careful. Gotta keep exercising. Don't wanna, you won't have to fall. You, keep, you guys gotta get into a system where you keep exercising. You don't have to become Arnold Schwarzenegger or The Rock, Dwayne The Rock. But it's good to have some muscle. It's That'll help pad things. It's good to have that strength to move things around. And you keep your bones firm also. Now, eventually, it's a losing job. But the longer you stay active, the less likely you are to have some severe problems. But you see, it becomes brittle if you don't have enough organic matrix. matrix. Look what happens if you take the inorganic out. You just twist the thing like a pretzel. It can't resist uh, compression. So you can come over to page uh, 190. Make sure you read the top of page 190. And then you have inorganic matrix and organic matrix. There's nothing real heavy in here, but it does uh, remind you of what the inorganic matrix is made of. That'll help you tell the difference between the organic matrix. So you want to read that particular um, Paragraph under inorganic matrix. Nothing heavy, just got to know it. You come down to organic matrix, and when you get into there, the second line, they're going to throw those big long words at you. Consists of protein fibers, proteoglycans, glycoaminoglycans, glycoproteins, and bone specific proteins such as osteocalcin. I'm not going to ask you about all those names, but you can tell me something about it right now, I bet. What do you know about a proteoglycans? Think for a second. Tell me what it is. Think on it. You already know this stuff. You've heard that. And you also know some of those prefixes and suffixes. Come all the way down to the next little paragraph under organic matrix. And you'll see those big words again. And you'll see this, they're in the ECM, the extracellular matrix. They draw water, we've already spoken about that, out of blood vessels by osmosis. We're back in chapter one. You see, if you don't understand that, you're going to get nailed. That's why you need to keep going over it and over it. The more you go over it, telling the closet door about some of the stuff in the past, you go, oh, I understand that. Okay, now I understand why we got to have these things. It's all part of homeostasis. But you can finish reading that on your own. Second column, bone cells. And uh, you can read through there. Basically, you got three, and you want to know the three types, and you want to know the functions of those bone cells. On page 192. Histology of bone tissue. And you see at the bottom, it says a structure of compact bone. So you look up at the top. Well, you can look at the bottom, first of all. Um, it's built for stress. But you look at the uh, last word in that little paragraph, first paragraph, or bottom paragraph, each tree. They're talking about cutting a tree in half. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Let me see something here. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see those waves in there? Those are like layers. This came out of an oak tree. I don't know if it's any better on the other side. Maybe when I put it like that. I use it on this little book, uh, book holder that I made. So I could put that up and just have it right in front of me. Because that book is big. You know, you could use that thing as a weapon. 
you throw that and hit somebody, they ain't going to hurt. That book was maybe about four or five pounds. So anyway, um, you when you cut a tree in half, you get to see all those rings. And it may tell you the tree's 35 years old or 75 years old or something like that. So they're describing the cross section of a bone on page 193 as making them think a little bit about a tree. Similar? Not exactly, but that, that was their, their choice. So you want to know the structures that constitute, that compose, that make up an osteon. An osteon is the functional unit of bone. And we have a lot of osteons that make up one bone. Look at the illustration, figure 6 9 on page 193, follow the arrow, and you see osteons. Now, if you look, you will see that there's a hole in the center, and then you got all these little rings around there and you got little holes between the rings, little spaces. So you want to know the terminology. As you look on page 192, back at that second column, you see the lamellae, the central canal, sometimes they call it a haversion canal. You see lacunae, A-E is pronounced E, that's Latin. Lacuna is singular. Catalliculi, singular would be catalliculus. And so you've got, if you look at a uh, osteon, look over to the right, and you can see they're just having the bottom layer or the outer layer, the next inner layer, the next inner layer, and there's that hole in the middle called a central canal. Sometimes they even call it a haversion canal. I think I've already mentioned that. And so... That's what looks like a tree. Each osteon has these rings, concentric rings, like a tree does. Now, the whole bone doesn't quite look like that. You just see little ones all spread out all through that big, long bone. So you can see them sticking past, uh, projecting past the, uh, on page six, nine, on figure six, nine, where you see uh, the little red arrow coming over from the bone and osteon. So there are three of them there, and it points to one that, that, that is not sticking up high or anything like that. So you want to be able to identify. You can see the little rings. Those would be called the lamellae, concentric layers of bone. And they have lacunae in there. Those are little... Um, cavities in which bone cells live. And then you have these canaliculi that connect the lacunae. And so cells will uh, communicate with each other. You remember how they do that? They've got little projections on their phospholipid um, membrane. And think about those connections that we talked about back in chapter Three, I think it was with the, the cell. You had three structures, protein structures that played a role where they could be connected. And one of the things they do is these guys talk to each other. These cells talk to each other. They communicate with each other. That's amazing, isn't it? Just amazing. So as you look over on page 193, you can see an actual picture. You see it says TEM620X. TEM is a transmission electron microscope. And you can see the central canal. You can see to the right of the central canal lacunae with osteocytes. But you see all those little kind of, looks like tiny little lines all over the place coming from the central canal out to those lacunae, those are the canaliculi. But you also notice there seems to be a, a ring-like structure in there. It starts at the haversion canal and goes 
out concentrically. Those are the lamellae, those are the layers. Just like a tree produces layers every year, we have something similar. I don't think I've got 73 rings in there. You get to a certain point, you keep those uh, rings just like they are. It's not quite like a tree would do, but it's, it's something similar to. Now, what I'm going to do a little bit later is uh, I'll give you another little lecture on uh, this so that you feel a little, maybe a little bit more comfortable with it. But I'm going to expect you to be able to look at this and identify the structures and know what the function of the structures are. All right. So let's see. All right. You can read about uh, on back on page 192, the bottom of the second column, about perforating canals or Volkmann's canals. And they've got those lab labeled in there. So you've got blood vessels going through the bone. You know, bone's not dead tissue. Bone is living tissue. And we're always making some or to breaking something down. So we're always trying to keep bones in good shape. Older you get, the harder it gets to do that. So you have to sometimes live with fractures and stuff. Now, one more thing, I believe it is. Let me check over here. Yep, just one more thing. We'll call it a quit. Call it quit. As you look at the bottom up on page 193, you see in the first column structure of spongy bone. Again, that can be called cancellous bone. As you look at the First couple of sentences, spongy bone is usually not the weight-bearing part of a bone. This dense part that is compact can withstand a lot of pressure, it's almost like rebar steel. I was looking uh, on YouTube the other day, and they had big athletes, guys and girls, and this one girl could pick up something like 500 pounds. Now, that's a lot of stress on those legs, on those hips, and so forth, and on those feet. She picked it up. Strong woman, but her bones didn't give way. So you've got mostly compact bones, but then these uh, cancellous bones, like around the epiphysis, those bones don't bear as much weight, so they don't need to be as dense. As you look at the bottom, on the first column, you see branching ribs of bone called trabeculae. Trabecula would be the singular. Trabeculae is the, uh, the plural. It says, you, if you look in the second sentence, it says trabeculae are covered with endosteum, and they do not contain osteans. But when you look at it, it's going to seem similar, but you don't have a big aversion canal in the middle. So as you look over on page 194, and you look at the top of the page, you got a nice picture there of uh, compact bone on the left side. And you see how it covers the spongy bone. And then you see the spongy bones inside. That's what the spongy bone looks like. It kind of reminds you of a sponge, doesn't it? With all these little air spaces in there. But it doesn't necessarily have air spaces because it could be where you have some fluids or maybe hematopoietic tissue depends on what bone we're talking about and you can see how the trabeculum one of them is cut in half it kind of looks like a haversion system doesn't it but there's no haversion canal there's no haversion canal but you do have the lamellae you see those rings called layers you can see the little um uh, lacuni with the uh, osteocytes, and then you can see the little canals coming away from the lacuni, and so cells can talk to each other, even in that dark place of our bones. So that takes care of the histology of the bone. Now, what we'll do uh, next week is I'll have another presentation. You see down at the bottom, it talks about bone formation. So we'll talk about that. There's two kinds of RNA formation, endochondral, because our bodies used to have cartilage uh, skeletons. 
and then we will we will talk about um, hormone, how it helps us grow, certain hormones do, and then on page 202, how we remodel and repair bone. Sometimes we break bone, don't we? But we're always remodeling it to keep it at its optimum best so that our bones are strong and we can do what we need to do. Okay, so that's the end of this little bit of a lecture. And next week, I'll put this in your mail uh, or in your week seven, I guess it is. I'll put that in there uh, probably tomorrow morning. This uh, They always want 24 hours whenever I do one of these things. So I'm able to put it in in the morning usually. Okay. All right. You guys have a nice evening. And remember, test is two weeks away, not next week. Read the, read the schedule. Okay, read the schedule. Be that week of the 12th or 14th or something like that. Right? See you later. <laughs>